Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome. We are so, so happy to be here tonight um, for our first program of the Slay exhibition. Uh, I'm so happy to see you all pouring in in the, um, in the webinar, in the virtual room. Hello, Karen. Um, this is Karen Tambor Rosenau. Uh, she is one of our speakers this evening, along with Don Reed Breen. Hi, Don. Coming to you live from the Frick. She is. Um, and we're just so excited to start off our um, the SLAY exhibition with a pre-program. You'll notice that the exhibition isn't open yet. Um, and we really believe that this particular story that we're going to be talking about today, Judith and Holofernes, um, which is the subject of both paintings in the exhibition, um, merits a, a full conversation, if not many, many more, which I believe we will be having, uh, particularly after you hear from these two women tonight. Uh, before we go any further, I want to read our land acknowledgement. The Frick Pittsburgh occupies the ancestral lands of the Haudenosaunee, the Lenape, Osage, and Shawnee peoples. As a place of history and nature, the Frick recognizes the cultural importance of land and the role of cultural institutions in the formation of collective memory. Displacement and erasure are not just histories for native peoples. Land acknowledgements, like historic sites themselves, are exercises in preservation and reconciliation engaged with past, present, and future. Um, just a few logistics before we get started. The live transcript is on, so your closed captions should be on if they're not. They are at the, they should be at the bottom of your screen for most people. You can just click on them or uh, toggle them on or off. You also can move them around your screen if they're in the way of an image or of one of the speakers by um, hovering over them and clicking and moving. Um, we will have <clears throat> a Q&A at the end of the presentation, uh, at the end of the discussion, excuse me. However, if you wanna throw in a comment or ask a question in the chat, or the Q&A, you're more than welcome. Um, I'll be monitoring them. And thank you to Amanda Gillen, who's in the background, uh, for also being here to support. And you can ask us any questions or, or to, uh, let us know if you need anything. Um, and I uh, just want to introduce, again, Karen and Don before I hand it over to Don. Karen Tamber Rosenau is <clears throat> an instructional assistant professor of Jewish studies and religious studies at the University of Houston. And as a place, of, uh, oh, sorry, um, she's an award-winning scholar and author. In 2018, she wrote Women in Drag, Gender and Performance in the Hebrew Bible and Early Jewish Literature. So thank you for being with us, Karen. Um, and I also want to introduce my colleague, Dawn Reed Breen. She is the chief curator and director of collections at the Frick Pittsburgh. Um, Dawn, along with Kololo Luckett, hi Kololo if you're out there, we're so lucky to have you, is um, co-curating or has co-curated our upcoming exhibition, Slay, um, Artemisia Gentileschi and Kehinde Wiley, which you'll be hearing more from Dawn about. Um, the exhibition is co-organized and we want to thank everyone involved by the North Carolina Museum of Art, the Capo de Monte Museum in Naples, Italy, uh, the Frick Pittsburgh and the Music Box. So without further ado, I will leave it to our two, um, our two panelists here who will um, engage in what I promise to be a wonderful discussion. So thank you so much, ladies. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Karen, for being here. I'm so excited. I've been looking forward to this program. I'm looking forward to diving into the story of Judith, which is the subject of two monumental paintings that will be on view at the Frick starting on Saturday, April 16th. Um, this is really the first of its kind um, exhibition pairing two major artists together looking at the same subject 400 years apart. Uh, one version created by Artemisia Gentileschi, who is one of the most successful painters of the 17th century Baroque Italy, and the second by Kehinde Wiley, a contemporary artist who is remixing the old masters. They are both looking at Judith slaying Holofernes. And Judith is a biblical heroine who 
single-handedly overthrows a powerful enemy to save her people. And her story has inspired countless works of art, sculpture, literature, music, and paintings. She is sometimes virtuous and demure, sometimes a seductive femme fatale, um, or a righteous, formidable heroine. So Karen, can you walk us through just the basic details of the Book of Judith? Sure. Let me um, share my screen um, and um, and uh, give you a little bit of um, of visuals as well. Okay. Okay. Are you seeing my? Um, are you seeing a presentation or are you seeing the present presenter view? We are seeing your presenter view. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. Um, so uh, the first really important thing I think to know about the book of Judith um, is that it is um, a book of the Apocrypha. So what that means is the Apocrypha is a collection of books, collection of texts that were written in the ancient world um, by Jews for other Jews in a Jewish um, ritual or holy text context. And they served for uh, for many Jews in the ancient world as holy texts in some fashion, it appears. Um, but when it finally came time to arrive at a, um, a, a broadly agreed upon um, version of, of sacred texts, everything in the Apocrypha was left out. So um, Judith is not the only text in the Apocrypha. Um, there are texts like First and Second Maccabees, the Book of Tobit, the Book of Ben Sira, um, a few of the more more notable ones. Um, Judith, I think, is the best, but um, but all of these texts are texts of the Apocrypha, so they ultimately don't get adopted into the the, the final Jewish canon. But when uh, the early church decides to um, take uh, into its own canon of scripture the Old Testament, what they, what they denote the Old Testament, um, and what Jews call the Tanakh or the Hebrew Bible, they also take along with those texts, the texts of the Apocrypha. So in the early days, the Apocrypha is canon for Christians and not canon for Jews. The situation shifts a little bit when we get to the Protestant Reformation because the reformers essentially um, throw all the apocryphal books out of the Bible, just vote it off the island. So um, what that means for us today is that if you um, come from a tradition that is Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox Christian, like Greek Orthodox or Coptic Orthodox, um, you have got the apocrypha in your Bible. You might be more familiar with these texts than uh, folks who are Protestant or Jewish who do not have the apocrypha in their Bible. Um, so I think it's it's important to start because we, we call the book of Judith a biblical story, but it's important to note that it's not in everybody's Bible. So if this is a, a totally new text to you, it may very well be because it is not in your Bible. Um, so it's probably written in the second century before the Common Era, um, and it survives only in Greek, but it may have been written in Hebrew or Aramaic and then translated. It is a work of historical fiction. And I say that because of several features of the text that um, I think would have served as like a neon sign flashing to people in the ancient world who were reading or more likely hearing this book read to them. Um, things that would have said, ah, okay, there's something here is not quite right. So the text is riddled with historical inaccuracies and totally anachronistic things. Um, and, and this is apparent from the very beginning of the book. So the very first verse of the book says, 
It was the 12th year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar who ruled over the Assyrians in the great city of Nineveh. And this is a cue to an audience that something is amiss here because Nebuchadnezzar was not an Assyrian, he was a Babylonian. And by the time he ruled, the great city of Nineveh did not exist anymore. So it is cueing, and anybody would have known that, it's cueing an audience that like something here, this is not straight history, this is something else. And then it continues, for the, the Judeans had only recently re returned from exile and all the people of Judea had just now gathered together and the sacred vessels and the altar and, uh, and the temple had been consecrated after their profanation. So it seems to be set in the days of the, the Judeans or the Jews returning from exile in Babylonia, but then the leader is the Babylonian, the Babylonian guy who conquered them decades earlier. Like the, the timeline is very strange. It doesn't make sense. And it's cueing us over and over again that something else is going on. This isn't, this isn't telling us something historical. Um, the geography is all muddled and it contains place names that may be fictional. And my favorite one of these is um, Judith's town is called Bethulia um, in the Greek. And this bears, I think, not a coincidental similarity to a Hebrew word, Betula. And that Hebrew word means virgin. And so the town is the town of virgin, virgin town. And they are the whole time, the whole story is about this town of virgin that is located um, at the end of a narrow mountain pass trying to keep away the invaders. And I think you see where I'm going with this. I don't think it is um, a coincidence. I think that, that it's, it's a symbolic name. And then Judith herself has a name that actually means Jewess, female Jew. Um, so, I mean, I don't, I don't think you can get a whole lot clearer that she is supposed to represent the nation. So that's just a little bit of background on the book, but um, uh, we can get into, into the story. So um, in the story of Judith, we have Nebuchadnezzar, who supposedly is an Assyrian, even though in real life, um, in real history, he's a Babylonian. He sends his general, whose name is Holofernes, to conquer a whole bunch of territories in the Levant region, which is where uh, Judea is located. A lot of other people just surrender because they see the Assyrian army, the most feared army in the ancient world, coming at them with chariots and horses and weapons, and it's terrifying, and they surrender but not the Judeans. They decide to resist, they prepare their defenses and they declare a fast. And meanwhile, Holofernes decides that he wants to know more about this people. Who are these people who will not surrender to me, the feared Holofernes? And he uh, meets a guy um, who comes to him and says, they, these people, they have God with them. Um, he tells them the whole story of the people's history. They were slaves in Egypt, and then they came out. God saved them, and they have God with them, and they cannot be conquered unless they sin. If they sin, God will use you as an instrument of God's punishment and let them be conquered. But if they've been righteous, you're out of luck. You're not going to ever be able to conquer them. Holofernes says, eh, I don't believe it, um, and lays siege to Bethulia. So he and his men surround the, the, the town of Bethulia and a siege is designed to starve people out. And that's what starts happening. Um, a, the book says that people start starving in the streets. They're, they're just falling down dead. It's uh, very difficult. And the elders of the town worry about, especially the children. They're like, well, you know, our children are dying in the streets. Um, we have to do something now. We have to intervene. Because if we, if we surrender, our children may be taken as slaves, but if we don't surrender, they will die. We need to figure this, this out now. So they say, we're going to hold off for five more days. And then if God has not made a miracle for them in five days, they will surrender to Holofernes and his Assyrian forces. And so far, you might be wondering, okay, this is the book of Judith. I haven't seen Judith yet. And that's because for the first half of the book, we don't even meet her. She's not even there. Um, it's all about military engagements and it's about um, the, the elders of Bethulia. But finally, in chapter eight, we get to meet our heroine. So Judith is introduced as a wealthy and pious and beautiful widow. And not only that, but she's got a really amazing pedigree. She has a really amazing background. They, the, um, 
The text traces her lineage back 16 generations, which is an incredibly extravagant genealogy for the Bible. People generally do not get that kind of genealogy. You don't trace back all their ancestors, especially not women. This is completely unprecedented. Um, so she's she's got she's got cred. She's got she's got cred with the with the Judeans, and she is personally unimpeachable. So not only that, but she lives in what to me is kind of this comic ascetic fashion. She is a widow and as a sign of her widowhood, even though she's been a widow for more than three years, she is still living in a state of mourning. Um, she sleeps in a tent on the roof of her house instead of in the house, even though she's got a lovely house. She fasts more days than she doesn't, which sounds terrible. And she rejects her beautiful clothing in favor of sackcloth. So she used to have all these beautiful clothing clothes that she wore when her husband was alive. Now she dresses in sackcloth all the time. Um, it, it's very over the top performance of like what it means to be a widow in the ancient world. So Judith hears that the elders plan to surrender and she summons them to her, her, her house and they come showing that she's got a lot of power and influence. And she yells at them for not trusting God. Who are you to give God a deadline of five days? You can't cold God to, to um, human time. This is unacceptable. So she says, don't worry about it though. I have a plan. Um, don't ask me what it is because I'm not going to tell you. Just, I'm gonna come out tonight and you need to open the gate for me and let me out of the town. So she, uh, she prays to God, this very long prayer, praying for identifying herself as a widow, telling God, I need strength, um, invoking her ancestors. Then she takes off her widow's clothing. She bathes despite the fact that they are under siege and there is no water and people are dying of thirst. Not a, not a concern apparently. Um, she dresses up in all the beautiful clothing that she used to wear when her husband was alive. She even finishes the whole thing with a tiara and she and her maid go out from Bethulia um, into the valley um, that, that, that abuts Bethulia. So um, she enters the Assyrian camp and she packs up and has her maid carry um, kosher food because she is pious, as we know, and she follows the dietary laws. And so she packs food that is suitable for her, um, for her journey. So Judith next uh, gets into the camp and she gets and receives an audience with Holofernes. And she tells Holofernes that she has come to him to surrender because the Jews are sinning. They have sinned. They are planning because they are starving to eat food that has been intended for sacrifice to God. And that is a sin. And because of that sin, she knows that God will let Holofernes conquer them. And meanwhile, she has, she flirts outrageously with him. She is flattering him. Oh, I know that you're the best general. She employs a lot of double speak. She keeps talking about um, the purpose that my Lord has designated. And he thinks she's talking about him, that she's calling him my Lord. And she's actually talking um, about God. And Holofernes then says to Judith, okay, you know, I, nobody else, no other woman in the world looks as beautiful or speaks as wisely as you do. And so he gives Judith shelter in the camp and says, yes, come on in, you can stay here. And Judith says, I'm going to go out every night into the valley. And when I go out, I'm going to be talking to God and I'm going to get a prophecy. I'm going to get a word from God of the exact moment when my people sin. And when they commit that sin, then that's the moment that you strike. And I'm going to tell you about it. So she stays in the, in the camp for three days. She spends her days in her tent. And then every night she goes out to bathe and she goes out to pray. And Holofernes on that third day says, oh, all right, if I don't try and have sex with her, she will laugh at me. Um, Yes, it's actually what it says. That's actually what the text says. So he says, all right, I, I, have to, I have to try my hand with this woman. And he invites her to have a drinking party in his tent. And she accepts his offer and goes into the tent. And he is so excited to possibly be intimate with Judith that he drinks so much. And he passes out drunk on his bed. And Judith, when he passes out, grabs the sword that is hanging above his bed, beheads him with his own sword, sticks the head in the now empty bag of food, hands it to her maid, 
leaves the camp and goes back to Bethulia, back through the valley, back open, uh, open the city gates in um, and tells everybody what has happened. And then she orders that the city elders, again, they listen to her, she's got status. She orders the head to be hung on the city wall. The Assyrians try to let Holofernes sleep in a little bit because they figure he's had a really good night, um, but eventually he's not coming out. They discover him in the morning, um, his headless body, and then they look up to Bethulia. They see the head on the wall and they are terrified and they scatter and Bethulia and Israel are saved. And Judith uh, leads a victory dance among all of the, uh, the Judean women. And many men want to marry her uh, and propose marriage to her, but she refuses them all and lives alone for the rest of her life um, and dies at the ripe old age of 105. So that is the story in a nutshell of Judith. I love your retelling of that story. I think it's clear like why it was such an appealing story because it is filled with drama. Um, so now that we kind of have that important context of the details of the story, I want to explore some of the ways in which it has been depicted in artworks over time. And we'll look at the two artworks featured in the exhibition sleigh as we go. Um, so your description of Judith, I think, has shown some of her unique characterization that really combines those so-called womanly virtues, you know, piety, humility, chastity, along with you know, physical strength to overthrow her oppressor. And so I think, and from my perspective, that's what really makes this story particularly ripe for artists who want to explore those dynamics of gender and power, um, and often looking specifically at female power and virtue and beauty. And I think, you know, like any narrative, so much depends on who's telling it and who's depicting it. And the story of Judith has kind of been interpreted as the underdog overthrowing evil, righteous triumph over heresy, political victory over tyranny, um, you name it, it's been used for a particular purpose. Um, the subject of Judith was so common, and particularly in early modern European art, and depictions of Judith often fall into two categories. You have the femme forte, who is the strong, virtuous woman, or you have the femme fatale, that sexually dangerous, devious, deceitful woman. Some of the earliest depictions of Judith um, come in the Middle Ages, and they really focus on her virtuous character. And she's often connected with the Virgin Mary um, in the kind of visual language, wearing blue, she's very demure, her clothes are somewhat plain, you know, she's pious, humble, and chaste, a virtuous warrior fighting on behalf of God. Um, because of these kind of allegorical connections as a symbol of virtue, she's often presented, you know, like a goddess. Um, and Botticelli's depiction of Judith is one of the most well-known, um, and she's incredibly graceful. She is strolling in the open air, a breeze is, you know, wafting her garments behind her. They look like they could be had a out for you know a picnic and not a beheading. <laughs> um, her servant is carrying Holofernes' head effortlessly atop her own head, and it's a very kind of serene, graceful depiction. Um, but by the beginning of the Renaissance, you start to see depictions of Judith often carrying an undercurrent of a political message. And one example of that is Donatello's bronze statue of Judith and Holofernes. This was originally placed in the Garden of the Medici Palace in Florence, where it was juxtaposed with the artist's statue of David, two characters who are known for slaying tyrants. And I think um, during the Renaissance, Italy was not a unified country at this point. They are collections of smaller, independent city-states. And the Medicis ruled Florence and no doubt commissioned these statues as an allusion to the power of their, the small principality of Florence. And you see Judith in this warrior stance, you know, she's 
holding the sword above her head. She is poised to strike down at Fuller Berenice. She is a less graceful, but no less beautiful depiction. While at the same time, you know, her head is very modestly covered. She looks somewhat similar to depictions of the Virgin Mary. Um, while her facial features are also very classical, kind of tying her to classical statue, um, statuary um, of an earlier period. And by the late Renaissance, you start to see depictions of Judith becoming a bit more seductive and a bit more aggressive. She transforms from a relatively simply dressed figure into an elaborately adorned noblewoman. And I love that Karen talked about how you know, she put on beautiful clothing so that she could enter the tent. And here you see Lucas Cronick, the elders version, showing Judith, who is you know, dressed to kill. <laughs> she is wearing an elaborate contemporary costume of the 16th century. She's still a kind of serene beauty, but I she's got a little bit more of a sly, steely smirk on the, on the gaze there. During this time, there's also an increasing emphasis on her physicality. So you start to see kind of a celebration of her body and the female form. Um, and it, you showed this depiction as well. Uh, that celebration of the female form often took an eroticized avenue. And in Northern Europe, which was obviously farther from the seat of Christianity in Rome, the story of Judith was often an excuse to paint a nude figure. And here you see um, an overtly erotic, you know, completely nude Judith who's looking very coyly down. Sometimes depictions show her looking out directly at the viewer, you know, less a representation of a biblical heroine and more, you know, an opportunity to create a titillating artwork. During the Baroque period, um, which is an era of art characterized by grandeur, drama, monumentality. The story of Judith was an opportunity to go big, and it gets really grisly. <laughs> As we've seen so far, artists are typically focusing on the moments immediately before or after the beheading and not the act itself. But that really changes with Caravaggio's depiction in 1599, um, one of the most iconic depictions of Judith. This um, the Baroque master captures Judith in the act. Um, there's kind of a horizontal composition that almost looks like a stage set. There's this really dramatic play of light and shadow, which is what Caravaggio was known for, this chiaroscuro, um, which makes it almost seem dramatically lit as if it is spotlit. You know, they are kind of static characters as much as the drama is happening. And I think this Judith, um, she's young, she's blonde, uh, she appears very hesitant. There's really nothing about her body language that would suggest that she is physically capable of completing this act. Um, and here, her servant who's standing next to her with the cloth sack ready to receive the head um, is depicted as an old, you know, haggard woman, kind of serving as a foil to further offset. Judith's youth and beauty. Um, but here Caravaggio can't kind of resist eroticizing and sexualizing the figure of Judith. You see her breasts and her erect nipples through her thin chemise. So there's still that element at play of a male artist depicting this female heroine. Artemisia undoubtedly saw and was influenced by Caravaggio's version. And while there are a lot of stylistic similarities between their treatments, you know, particularly within that play of light and shadow, their compositions really diverge greatly. And this is the example that you will see in the galleries in the Slay exhibition. Um, here you have a very vertical composition, and it is a monumental painting. It's large and oversized and presented with a realism that is unsettling, shocking. I think this shocked Italian audiences in the 17th century and it kind of continues to shock when you see it today. Um, and here you see Judith in tandem working with Abra, her maidservant who um, 
is depicted as a contemporary and kind of equally engaged in the work with Judith. They are resolute on the task at hand, you know, sleeves are rolled up, gazes are focused. And this depiction by Artemisia Gentileschi is often interpreted in light of her own experience with sexual violence. When she was 17, Agostino Tassi, who was a colleague of her father and um, had been commissioned as a painting tutor for her, raped her in her own home. It's one of the most well-documented facts of Artemisia's life because the ensuing trial was recorded and Janileski was tortured to verify her testimony. And while Tossi was found guilty, there's no evidence that he ever served his sentence. Um, the Pope likely interceded on his behalf. And so a lot of scholars read this as um, a kind of portrayal of psychological revenge a kind of justice that gentle as he was denied or a symbol of her female rage as a woman working within a male dominated field. And I think Caravaggio and Artemisia's version, you know, there are two other versions created um, shortly after that really have the same kind of feel and immediacy um, and kind of carry the same agency that gentle as he gave to her Judith. By the 19th century, the image of Judith really um, starts to evolve into a more desirable and often dangerous femme fatale. You see artists kind of negotiating the ambiguity of the story's phrasing that she delighted Holofernes, um, which is something Karen and I will talk about in a little bit, depicting her in a really highly eroticized fashion, um, often as an absolutely brazen seductress like Gustav Klimt's version in 1901. Um, Klimt's Judith, she doesn't even have a sword. She doesn't need a sword to destroy this man. Um, and, and her facial expression is one of just like intense pleasure at, at, at um, taking this powerful figure down. Somewhat similarly, German symbolist Franz von Stuck um, often played played with those same ideas. This is one of many, many versions that he created from this story. And while the popularity of um, Judith's story kind of waned throughout the 20th century, she still speaks to contemporary artists and contemporary audiences. So here we have more Morimura Yasumasa's um, depiction, Mother Judith II. He is a Japanese-born photographer who is known for appropriating very recognizable images of art history, um, often portraits, and inserting his own likeness and visage into the frame in place of the traditional subject. And born and raised in Japan, he has been very outspoken about his experience as a student of art history, that he was fed a diet of art history which prized Western artworks. So his self-portraits um, are really a critique of the teaching of art history from a Eurocentric viewpoint. And here we see him interpreting Lucas Cronet the Elder's version of Judith, which we saw earlier. And I think um, this is such an important example to show because it really closely relates to Kehende Wiley's approach. Um, Kehende Wiley is a Black American painter who's known for hyper-realistic portraits of young Black men and women. And he uses the visual vocabulary of old European masters, kind of remixing them with contemporary culture um, and physically putting Black bodies in you know, positions and paintings that are often associated with white aristocracy. And speaking about his work, Wiley has stated, the whole conversation on my work has to do with power and who has it. And Kehinde's version of Judith was created in 2012 um, as part of his first series of paintings to feature female subjects in economy of grace. And as in his earlier work, um, he always bases his portraits on um, specific sources, in this case, case, a 17th century painting of Judith um, by an Italian artist. And so you can kind of see how he is 
translating the physical body language of Judith within this portrait, um, showcasing her as a modern Black woman who is standing strong with a gaze directly out at the viewer. She is attired in this incredibly elegant, beautiful gown, um, and really creating a work that interrogates those structure, structures of power um, and identity and representation within art history. And it's really an incredible opportunity to have two of the most iconic versions of Judith that have ever been created. These are exactly 400 years apart, kind of conversing with each other in the gallery. I think both of these versions speak to the time in which they were created, but they also speak to each other. I think they continue to speak to us today. So I'm kind of excited to get, Karen, your perspective on what exactly it is about the story of Judith that makes it such an enduringly appealing narrative for artists to go back to. Well, I do think it is um, in large part the idea, you, you know, you kind of alluded to it, that it, it, it became for some an excuse to pay, paint a naked woman, <laughs> which is very funny because um, the, the moment that they choose to represent Judith nude is the moment of her killing Holofernes, which is there are parts of the story where she's naked, presumably while she's bathing, but nobody ever does that one. So it's, it's, it's instead, it's this tantalizing combination of sex and violence. So they choose to see her nude at that moment um, where she is also uh, beheading Holofernes. So I think it, it is this idea of, um, of sex as a moment of vulnerability and a moment of danger. Um, the story is very clear that Judith does not have sex with Holofernes. Um, the story is clear and then Judith herself is very clear when she gets back to Bethulia. I swear it was the beauty of my face and it was my, my smarts basically that seduced him. I was not defiled. She's really, really clear on that point. But, but I understand that, you know, it was, it's, it's too tantalizing, it's, it's too irresistible to um to combine sex and violence in that way at the moment of um you know the, the the preparation for the death the the act itself or the aftermath to combine you know sexuality whether it's nudity or just you know um scantily clad or you know a clingy blouse or whatever it is um and the the violence and the bloodletting that you see in some of those pictures so i yeah it it's it, it's the sex and the violence and and the story has it all so it's irresistible. I hadn't really thought until you were answering um, how much emphasis is put on Judith kind of defending herself and how women women's word isn't always taken even, even today. And thinking about Artemisia Genaleski's experience in her, the testimony, um, in her testimony, she was tortured with the Sibylle, which is um, rope tied around your fingers. Um, incredibly painful to verify her testimony, even though it was her rapist, Agostino Tossi, who was on trial. So there's a connection there that I hadn't really made until, until you started to answer. Um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about the maidservant, because she appears in some depictions of Judith and not in others and as we as we saw in kind of wildly different representations as well where does she really feature in the story so it's interesting because she's she's such a minor character she doesn't even get a name um you know later tradition calls her Abra but she's not named in the story at all um which is not uncommon for characters in the Bible to remain unnamed. It's especially not uncommon for female characters. And then when you add to that, that she is a servant um, or, you know, because the boundaries between servitude and slavery in, in biblical, the biblical world are very fuzzy. Like we can even read her as a slave. Um, she is not, um, 
not a major figure, but she is there for everything. She is there when Judith walks out um, of the of the town. She's there when Judith talks her way into the enemy camp. She's there. If not, so the text is is um, it's pretty clear that Judith and Holofernes are alone together in the tent. It's just the two of them. Um, so it is interesting that uh, artists do interpret her into the scene there, and and some of them even have her helping. Um, where in in the text itself, she's there to receive the head um, when Judith leaves the tent, but she's not actually there for the deed itself. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think it is interesting that she has this variety of portrayals. You mentioned, you know, sometimes she's young, sometimes she's old, sometimes it seems like when Judith looks kind of peaceful and innocent, like the maid is made to represent the like the the id, right? The 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 more murderous desires. Um, but all of that, all of that is interpretation. And the the great thing or the tricky thing about the Bible and biblical literature is that it is so sparing in its description of events that artists can really go pretty wild because you know there, there's so much that's not said. The Bible is so terse um, that that there's a lot of room for interpretation. And I think that, that that's what hap what's happening with the maidservant. I think what makes um, Artemisia Gentileschi's inclusion of the maidservant so unconventional, I mean, everything about her painting was really unconventional for the time period, but I think it is the fact that um, she depicts her servant as a contemporary. They are a similar age. Um, they, they are in it together as comrades, which it's always so tempting to read artists biographical details into their making of a painting, which I think is why so many scholars put an emphasis on her life experience and in interpreting it or um, thinking about her as a female and a male dominated field, maybe wanting to create a sense of camaraderie or female companionship that maybe she did or maybe didn't have. There's so many things kind of like the Bible <laughs> that we just won't know. I think new details about her life continue to emerge, but um, there's always an element of interpretation and interpreting from the stance of when the art is created and interpreting it today. I am hoping that we'll get some questions um, from our audience members. Please feel free to put them into the Q&A or the chat. Um, I have a lot of other questions, but I want to give room for, <laughs> for others to ask some too. And I, I know Lisa was maybe going to come back and Lisa may have some questions to help us kick off the Q and A portion. Um, what what else do you think we should know about that story of Judith? What else would you encourage visitors to kind of have in their mind as they come to this exhibition? So, I would recommend considering that Judith is, you know, there have been scholars who interpret her as acting like a man because she is taking up weapons of war and not leaving it to she's not leaving it to the elders she's not leaving it to soldiers on the battlefield she is doing this very unwomanly thing so she must be acting like a man but i really would encourage people to keep in mind that what the text has her doing is yes absolutely the ultimate you know instrument of death is a sword manly fine However, the only reason that she is able to get there and use the sword is because she is acting like a woman. She is using um, the stereotypes and assumptions of what women are like and what women can do and can't do um, to talk her way in. Um, she, I mean, she, she literally um, dresses in feminine finery. She literally changes her appearance she, um, as I argue in my book, she basically puts on drag and she, she is in drag as the sexy, beautiful, seductress woman, even though it seems through the whole story, she has no intention of actually sleeping with Holofernes. She has no intention of getting married again. She's not sexually available. 
but her her drag persona is this like femme fatale um sexy lady and and she that's what she does and so i i mean i think that that lots of the artwork that you showed is you know is underscoring that point that she is um she's very she's putting on this femininity right a lot of the artists really do put her in um in quite uh, elegant clothing or very elaborate um the chronic um where she's very very um uh, very well put together, very upper class, you know, her hat is arranged just so. Um, and, and so I think that that I would encourage people to think about the way that she is using femininity itself as a weapon of war. Um, you, we had talked um, a little bit earlier about, about all of this. And Karen, you mentioned something about Judith as, um, as a mother figure um, for the city that she was defending, but that she was not actually a mother. And it just made me think about both, both paintings in particular, um, that there's sort of a motherhood slash hero, you know, um, story going on there. Just your, what are your thoughts about that, that sort of side of it? So I do think it's really interesting um, that Judith is not a mother. And I say that because you know, for, for all intents and purposes, if if it's not in the story itself, like it's not there, right? Because we don't think that Judith is a real historical person. Um, so if the text is not describing her as being a mother or as having children, uh, for all intents and purposes, she doesn't have them. Um, and I think that's very interesting because a lot of biblical heroines are heroines because of their connection to childbearing. And Judith is so disconnected from that world. She is not a mother. She is clearly never going to be a mother in the story because she is, she's childless and then she doesn't, she refuses all um, attempts to, you know, all, all, all the men who proposed to her, she says, no, no, I'm good alone, thanks, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> um, so no kids and the 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 men in the story are constantly talking about the children oh you know what are going to happen what's going to happen to our children and judith by and large does not do that mm -hmm. um she is mainly talking about the present she's talking about the people who are there right now everybody else is talking about the the children what are we going to do about the children she's like you know she doesn't actually say this but my interpretation is she's saying i forget the children for a minute like can we can we please stop focusing on the future so much that we lose the past like lose the present mm -hmm. what if, what if we what if we focused on what happens now and the people who are already here and deal with that let's try that for a minute thank you um don we have a couple um questions in the Q&A and in the chat. Um, I'm going to ask you ask you both this. Can you talk more about the Kahinde Wiley painting uh, and specifically the depiction of Holofernes in it? Um, so is that a woman's head is the question. I've never seen this work, so I'd love to hear more about it. Yeah. Um, I, so the Kahinde Wiley version, that is a woman's head. Who is representing the traditional Holofernes role. Um, and I love kind of the visual language between the two. On the left in Artemisia's version, you see Judith's fist kind of holding Holofernes' hair down. And then in Kehinde Wiley's version, Judith is holding this woman's ponytail. And I think this can be interpreted as Wiley using the story of Judith as a device to assert the systemic racism in American history. I think um, a lot of Kehende's work has to do with representation. And, you know, he was, he was a student of art um, growing up in California, visiting museums, developing this love of old master portraits, you know, these grand projections of power and prestige, but very aware that people of color were not in those depictions. So I think a lot of his work with these beautiful portraits of contemporary black men and women is you know, physically putting those bodies on the walls of museums, um, acknowledging, calling out what is 
beautiful to him, which he has not seen represented as beautiful in a lot of culture. Um, we have uh, another question. Um, could you please speak more about the role and status of the servant, um, which we did talk a little bit about, and also that should we assume that she would also have been Jewish and did Judith free her afterwards, indicating that she was a slave? So um, the, we don't know about the, the ethnic or um, you know, origin of the servant or slave. Um, we do have at the end of the story, a note that Judith before her death uh, freed her, her freed, freed her maidservant. So yeah, I mean, I think if she had to free her, we are probably talking more about, um, about slavery than what we might consider, you know, being a servant. Um, we also have, uh, oh, Karen, do you want to answer? Um, there's a question about Judith being associated with the Jewish holiday. So yeah, the question is Judith is associated with a Jewish holiday. Is it Sukkot? Um, and is there, and there was a reference that she gave Holofernes cheese, yes? Okay, so the Jewish holiday that Judith is often associated with is the holiday of Hanukkah. Um, and I, I love uh, that this question was asked because I, I love clearing this up. Um, so it is associated with Hanukkah, even though Hanukkah is not mentioned at all in the, the story. And, and the, two, the, the story of Hanukkah and the story of Judith really have very little, um, if anything, to do with one another. Um, however, in the Middle Ages, there uh, were, Judith basically disappeared from Jewish consciousness for hundreds of years. It reemerges in the Middle Ages. And when it reemerges, Judith is different. She is um, often described not as a widow, but as a virgin. Um, she uh, then she, she is said to uh, give her law for needs cheese. She feeds him cheese and she feeds him cheese to um, make him thirsty because the cheese is salty. So he, she wants him to drink more wine. And um, so all of, and, and it's at this point that Judith also becomes associated with the holiday of Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. So um, so we often talk about Judith around Hanukkah time, even though in the book itself, nothing related to it. Um, and the cheese thing is, is medieval and not um, original to the ancient book. Thank you for that for that explanation. Um, Don, I'm going to ask you to address, um, there's a, qu a question, why is the head a, fem a female rather than a male? It's a big question. It is a big question. And, you know, Kehande has not spoken publicly, kind of outlined exactly why that choice is. So again, it's something that's, you know, open to a interpretation. And I think one reading, um, is thinking about the role of white women within mm -hmm. these systemic uh, racism that has upheld American society for centuries, um, thinking about white women peers, just kind of thinking about how the role of white women and, and holding back black women. Um, you could read it on a lot of different levels. I think it could be read in terms of um, different gender inequity, racial violence, societal beauty standards. I mean, I think there are all sorts of interpretations. Um, it is, I think, one of the only depictions of full of fairness as a woman. But I, it's, it is such a great question. You know, what does it mean for Judith to be depicted as a contemporary Black woman? What does it mean for whole fairness to be a woman? And there are questions in there that can really provoke conversation. Mm -hmm. Karen, can I ask you to follow up to what Don just said? I know that you are our biblical scholar and Don is our art, art scholar, art history scholar. But what, as someone who has studied the story and you are very familiar with many depictions of it, what is, do you have sort of thoughts about the depictions being pretty different from what we're used to, what we've seen, um, particularly that Hola Fairness in this is, a female and your your work in you know gendering and performance and queering and all of that so just yeah what do you think about that i mean if i were to to hazard uh, 
an educated <laughs> guess. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if we want to um, see, if we want to look back at the history of interpreting, um, you know, the text itself, and then the history of interpretation and in art of the relationship between Judith and Holofernes as very um, loaded with sexual innuendo. Mm -hmm. um, I am wondering if maybe that that sexual innuendo, um, what we can do is perhaps read uh, the artist as saying, okay, there is some sort of sexual danger um, posed mm -hmm. by, by white women, you know, that there's some, some sort of sexual, and I'm thinking of, of things like, um, like Emmett Till, um, right, who, who was um, murdered after it was believed that he had, you know, a white woman said that he whistled at her. And I'm wondering if, if we, what we see there that the white woman's head might be, you know, more than the complicity of mm -hmm. white women in systemic racism, but more specifically, like the, the sexual, um, the sexual role there, the sexual innuendo there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was, that was great. <laughs> that, was, that was great. You, you're now an art historian. No. <laughs> um, we have time for um, a couple. There's two other questions I see here, um, or a few more. What is, I think I asked this question at one point, what is the symbolism behind Wiley's use of a flowered background and are specific flowers relevant to the story? So in, in Kehinde's work, his his portraits um, and specific references to artwork almost always have these like beautifully lush, gorgeously colored floral details in the background. And often they are pulled from patterns or even color schemes of the period that they're referencing. So in this um, in this instance, it is a kind of Italian Renaissance style pattern that you might see on some of the beautiful um, ornate silks that were coming out of Florence and Italy and France at the at that time. Um, and I love how they kind of entangle her feet. So we've been having a lot of conversations internally. Um, sharing different materials and thinking about how some people have read this as um, you know kind of entangling her as she's stepping free of them and then others have seen it as a caressing and kind of they're lovingly tenderly wrapping themselves around her mm -hmm. um, so I think you can read that how you like but I don't think there's any specific floral reference to the biblical story of Judith so that is Gehendi's you wouldn't you would know right Karen <laughs> I don't recall anything about flowers. <laughs> right. Um, there is a comment here that harkens back to something that you were talking about. Um, it's just a comment, perhaps Judith's semi-nudity semi was a means of relaxing her victim and encouraging his drinking, which you, when you were talking about the cheese, I believe you covered that. Um, so that's a, a good point brought up. And we have one, uh, it's almost eight o'clock. So I just wanna be, um, respectful of everyone's time, but we do have just one more question and then we can we can wrap up. Um, thanks for ever, everyone for sticking with us here. Um, someone is asking, can you talk a little bit more about the Judith story in the context of the counter-reformation? Do you think Artemisia was responding to that context? I think she certainly could have been. I think a lot of artists who were painting Artemisia in that time period were connecting that story to the Counter-Reformation as kind of the church's triumph over heretics. And I think likewise, it could be, um, it could serve in the inverse as well. So any sort of purpose. Uh, does, do either of you have, I, I feel like I have 12 more questions now, um, <laughs> but I will just ask each of you if you want to maybe uh, say anything else or sum up what you've talked about or what we've talked about here, um, and then we'll release everyone into this beautiful night. I don't have anything to add. Okay. <laughs> I want to say thank you to Karen so much. I think having the context of this story and you know the, the true biblical details give us, us a better sense of how artists are playing with this story in their own depictions. It's made me think 
it's I have different thoughts um, even after spending a lot of time with both of these paintings I'm thinking about them a little bit differently each time so thank you so much for bringing this perspective and I, I hope that we'll see visitors in the galleries with open hearts and curious minds and come with an eye for looking. <laughs> yes um, well thank you to both of you um, this was really exactly what we had hoped for um, in advance of our show opening to really get some deep context. This is really a, a story um, that I think it's it's extremely important to understand. The work standalone is beautiful, you know, pieces of art, but the story brings it sort of enriched, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it really shows the complexity of the story um, and that one look is not going to do it. So come back again and again. Um, I just want to mention a few things before we head out. Um, well, first of all, Karen and Don, you should check out the chat. People are, are thanking you and saying wonderful things. Uh, this recording will be available for everyone on YouTube. Um, if you want to go back and refresh before you come or send it to somebody, um, it'll be there. Uh, we also have some really great programming uh, programs coming up. Sorry, a slate of programs coming up, and I just want to call your attention to a few. We have three screenings over the the course of the exhibition of Economy of Grace, which Don mentioned. It is a documentary about um, Kehinde Wiley's work. It's um, going to be in the auditorium. You can go online to find out the dates and register. We also have in-gallery conversations on Thursdays and Saturdays through the exhibition, which is a really wonderful way to engage with, with what you see um, hanging on the walls and to talk about, um, talk about what you see and maybe even more questions that you don't know to ask. Um, we're, gonna be, we're gonna be in there for you on those days. And then also a live virtual gallery night with uh, Kalolo Luckett, who I saw in the chat. Hi, Kalolo. Um, and there are a number of other programs that are um, online and in person. We're, we're back to a mix, which we're happy to be back. Um, and so thank you to everyone. Truly, thank you uh, again on this beautiful evening. I feel like this was a great start to this exhibition. Karen, you were perfect. So per perfect for us. Um, and so we just thank you so much. And Dawn, as ever, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful night. Thank, Thank you, you for having me. Good night. Thank you.